What if I told you that Portland real estate is scarcer than gold or that Manhattan has a stronger scarcity profile than Bitcoin? Most investors have never even heard of the term stock to flow ratio, but it might be one of the single most important frameworks for understanding which assets will preserve your wealth over the next 50 years and which ones will evaporate into the sky. Today, I'm going to break down a concept that I picked up from the crypto community. I'm going to apply it to real estate, stocks, and gold, and show you why most of what you own is quietly being inflated away while you sleep. This is controversial. It's possible in this video that I will anger gold enthusiasts and Bitcoin enthusiasts and anti-Portland people at the same go. But we're going to go for it anyways, because that's what we do. We like to uh, challenge conventional wisdom. And many of you might hate it, but it's okay. The data does not lie. So let's get into this. So the stock to flow ratio measures one thing. How hard is it to inflate the supply of an asset? Here's the formula. Stock equals total existing supply. Flow equals new supply added per year. Stock to flow ratio is stock divided by flow. The higher the ratio, the harder it is to dilute the asset. The harder it is to dilute, the better it preserves value. Let me give you an example. Gold has a stock to flow ratio of about 66. That means it would take 66 years of current mining production to double the existing gold supply. That's why gold has been an excellent store of value for around 5,000 years and more. And there's many other aspects to this, the cultural value of gold. There's so many great things about gold. Like I, you know, I love gold. Bitcoin, post having its stock to flow ratio is about 93. That's why Bitcoin maximalists call it digital gold. The supply is programmatically constrained. You cannot dilute it because you cannot produce additional supply. Now, Bitcoin does rely on a relatively unproven thesis. It's been proven and it's, it's, I guess it's been proven for about 10 years, right? It doesn't have 5,000 years of track record like gold does. It relies, the trust aspect in Bitcoin is that everybody will continue to think it has value, right? Theoretically, it's the same for gold. Gold, if it was demonetized and people stopped thinking it had value and it just had commercial use, the value would go down, right? So we are, in both assets, are reliant upon people believing that it has some value. The strength of gold is that it's been proven for 5,000 years, right? Bitcoin's been proven for 15 years. And I've been very, very, very wrong on Bitcoin. I fondly remember, in fondly remember, making fun of Bitcoin in 2014 when it was under $1,000. And I wish I'd bought, honestly. I don't know if I believe in it long term, but I would have made a mint. So wish I'd done it. What is the stock to flow ratio of fiat currency? The US dollar has a stock to flow of about 15 over the last decade. That's why your dollar has lost 87% of its purchasing power since 1971. So the framework is simple. E equals durability. Now, here's what we did, right? And we're real, you know, we call people Bitcoin maxis and gold bugs. We are real estate maxis slash bugs, right? We, that's what we like. And I, here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to take the stock to flow ratio and apply it to real estate. So I ran the numbers on U.S. housing using 10 years of data. The U.S. housing market has an average stock to flow ratio of 120. That means housing is harder to inflate than gold. It's harder to inflate than Bitcoin. And it's massively harder to inflate than fiat currency. Why? Because you can't print houses. You can't just mine more housing in Manhattan or San Francisco. Supply in these markets is fundamentally constrained by geography, zoning laws, nimbyism, construction costs, and political regulation. And here's where it gets even more interesting because not all cities are created equal. So I went deeper and I broke down 10 major U.S. cities and the results are really interesting. So what are some examples of really high stock to flow ratio cities? San Francisco, 150 plus. Manhattan, 140 plus. Portland, 135. Chicago, 125. Low stock to flow ratio cities, i.e. cities where it's very easy to dilute the existing supply, Austin. 45. Kansas City, 40. Nashville, 42. Do you see the pattern? And here's where I'm going to anger another cohort. Blue state urban cores with restrictive zoning have Bitcoin gold level scarcity metrics better, arguably. They just cannot add supply fast enough. 
Red state, some belt cities are building like crazy, lower barriers, more land, higher flow. Now, I'm not saying that because a red state city has a low stock to flow ratio, it's a bad investment. I'm not saying that at all. People make a lot of money in these cities. But what I am saying is understand what you're buying. In Austin, you are betting on growth overwhelming supply. It can work, but it's a growth bet, not a scarcity bet. And in my humble opinion, it's harder to predict a growth bet than to predict a scarcity bet. In San Francisco or Manhattan, yes, even with Mumdami coming, potentially coming into power, Manhattan as well, you're still betting on structural irreplaceability. That is a scarcity bet. Now, here's the part that's fascinating, right? Because I've been, you know, I talk a lot about Bitcoin, gold, real estate. It's what I do. But I was for years at Goldman Sachs and at Fisher, a stock market guy. So I wanted to take the stock to flow ratio of the stock market because the stock market is just a market of things that you can buy. You're buying stocks, right? You're buying ownership in companies, real businesses that produce income. And like anything else, that's a supply and demand market. If more people want to buy stocks than stocks exist, prices go up, right? I mean, like you have to boil it down to its basics. It is a supply and demand market. So I ran the stock to flow analysis on the S&P 500. And guess what? The S&P 500, the U.S. stock market, has the highest stock to flow ratio of any asset class. Why? Because of buybacks. The stock market doesn't just resist inflation. It's structurally deflationary. Companies eat their own supply. Every year, net equity supply shrinks. Since 2010, U.S. companies have bought back over $7 trillion in stock. It's not adding supply. It's actually reducing it. So here's the controversial take for you all. The S&P 500 might be the hardest asset on earth. It's scarcer than Bitcoin. It's scarcer than gold. And it's scarcer than real estate. Now, what does that mean that you should automatically own stocks? No, because stocks have other risks, right? Earnings volatility, market sentiment, company-specific risk. But from a supply inflation perspective, the U.S. stock market is quietly one of the best stores of value in human history. All right, so what do you do with this? Here's the hierarchy of assets based on the stock to flow metric. U.S. equities, the highest. In fact, I believe it has an infinite stock to flow ratio because its supply is constantly reducing. It is not increasing. High barrier real estate, San Francisco, New York City, Chicago, Portland, Bitcoin post having. These all have stock to flow ratios of greater than 100. Hard assets, stock to flow ratios of 50 to 100. Gold. U.S. housing on a national average and select growth markets with some barriers. And then the softest assets, fiat currencies, Sunbelt real estate, and many commodities. The takeaway is if you want to preserve wealth over decades, you need exposure to tier one assets, period. And I know I included Bitcoin in that list. I am not advocating you buy Bitcoin. That is because you're up to you what you want to do with that. I, I own very little Bitcoin personally, but I have some because I like to watch what it does. If you're holding cash long term, you're being inflated away at a stock to flow of 15 to 20. Arguably, it's going to be even higher in the coming future. If you're betting on Austin real estate, you're betting on growth, not scarcity. That's fine. Just know what game you're playing. If you're in Manhattan or San Francisco real estate, you're holding a Bitcoin equivalent scarce asset. The supply cannot, cannot expand to meet demand. And if you're in the S&P 500, you're holding one of the most structurally scarce assets in human history. That is the game, okay? And there's a lot more to this analysis than just looking at the stock to flow ratio, but it is the argument for Bitcoin. So I wanted to apply it to other asset classes to see how they, how, they, how they fare against everyone else. And arguably, personally, I would wanna own the S&P 500 in real estate. Why? They're productive. They do something, right? Like you own the S&P 500, you own businesses that produce real revenue and income. They're doing something. If you own real estate, it has a functional use. It's needed. It's required. People are going to always use it. So look, I'm a real estate investor. That's what I do. But I'm also a student of history, markets, and monetary systems. And the lesson from every imperial collapse, Rome, Spain, Britain, is this. When the currency debases, hard assets win. Gold won. Land won. Equity and productive enterprises win. Now, the people who held fiat, they got destroyed. So here's my advice. Build a portfolio on structural scarcity. Own real estate in supply-constrained markets. Own equities with pricing power. Own assets that can't be printed, can't be inflated, and cannot be easily replicated. Because the next 20 years will reward some growth chasers, but it's a dangerous bet. But it's definitely going to reward scarcity holders. If you found this useful, drop a comment. Tell me if you agree or disagree. 
If you want more deep dives like this, please subscribe to the Timeless Investor on Substack. The link is below. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Think well, act wisely, build something timeless.